good evening, ladies. <laughs> oh, um, well, I'm super excited for tonight. <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to share a scripture just to give um, a little bit of an idea of what's going on tonight. So let's let's go to Second Peter. Oh, I mean, sec yeah, Second Peter, chapter one. <laughs> Um, and we're going to start in verse 5, 2 Peter 1, verse 5. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And very excitingly tonight, we're going to be able to hear short charges about each and every one of these qualities. And uh, I have the privilege tonight of talking about goodness. And so if you will... Please turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Now, when I was looking up the definition of goodness, there were like three different definitions in the Greek. Um, it was excellence, virtue, and kindness. And so because of uh, time, we're going to look at kindness. And so in Luke 10, verse 30, it says, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Jesus asked, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And that's the title of my short charge and first point is go and do likewise. And I love this scripture, right? I love how in Jesus describing what a good Samaritan was, he really was describing God's goodness through his kindness and his mercy. And it's convicting too, right? Because it goes to show it doesn't matter what you call yourself. You can call yourself a priest, a Levite, a Christian, a disciple, but when that sister asks you for a ride to midweek, do you complain? Do you get frustrated? Or do you, do you just give her a ride, right? When that sister leaves a dish in the sink, do you hold a record of wrongs? Or are you compassionate, right? When your coworker or your boss is being unfair, do you have a fit of rage? Or when you're studying the Bible with a woman or even when one of your own sisters decides to walk away from God, do you choose bitterness or compassion? Right. And I love this scripture because it reminds me of honestly myself before studying the Bible. Right. And I think a lot of us really were women who were beaten, who were robbed and who were stripped down of our identities from Satan in the world and by um, by the world. Right. But in God's goodness and in his kindness and in his mercy, he decided to allow someone to share their faith with us or to study the Bible with us. He sent his son to die for us in his kindness and in his mercy. And I think at times, sisters, when we come into the kingdom, we can begin to lack this kindness and this mercy all over again because of fear, because of hurt, right? We don't want to get hurt again. What if we give this kindness and it's not returned back, right? But in reality, ladies, like, how many churches in the world actually creates atheists? You know, sometimes our lives are the only Bible that people actually read. And let it not be said that the kingdom of God is just like one of those other churches, right? And so my sisters, 
my challenge for you this evening is to go and do likewise. It's to go and, and give an act of kindness to someone else in your life. And not just someone else, but someone that you know you've been withholding love from. You know, you've been holding a record of wrong or you've been unkind, you've been impatient, untrusting, right? Sisters, this is my challenge is to go and to, to give an act of kindness to them. But I love you all so much, and to God be all the glory. Good evening, sisters. Thank you so much, Regine and Sama, for allowing me to preach. And Jenna, thank you for your amazing charge on goodness, which to add to your goodness, you must add to your knowledge. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 1 through 5. Can I get an amen when you guys are there? Awesome. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so I'll stop here. I don't have time to share the whole scripture, but what happens right after is Eve falls for the lie and she gets him to sin. And so the title of my charge is Don't Be Deceived, Remember Eve. <laughs> And so sometimes, to be completely honest, sometimes I read this and I'm like, what the heck, Eve? Like, man, now childbirth is painful. We have premenstrual pains. I mean, Lindsay knows all about this. And we can judge Eve, you know? But you know what? I remember when I was Eve, when I had those questions in my heart, did God really have a plan for me? And the echoes of Satan taunted me. Did God really say? And I tried to answer this question with the world. When I graduated high school and moved from home, I thought I had what everybody wanted. I entered the modeling industry. I got a contract at 18 to model overseas. I was dating. I was in a relationship with a guy that was already working. And I thought, I got it. I have the career in the man. This is it. But the career I had criticized me, it sexualized me, it picked me apart. I struggled with weight and mental health. I was in an unhealthy relationship where the guy ended up hurting me and my best friend. And I saw that the world couldn't answer that question. And like Eve, I became deceived into thinking that what I needed was outside of God. And I kept wondering, does God still have an amazing plan for my life? And maybe lately, maybe even tonight, you've been asking, did God really say he has a plan to prosper me and not to harm me, plans to give me hope and a future? And when I was first studying the Bible, I didn't have the knowledge to answer the question. But ladies, that's when Satan attacks you, whether or not you really know the word of God. And maybe you have been hearing that, God, did he really say? God, did you really say I have a purpose to live for far bigger than myself? And so let's look at Genesis 127. And here lies the truth. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so in Genesis 1, we had the truth to Eve's question all along. But in Genesis 3, Satan tricked Eve by getting her to think, that maybe God didn't intend to give her the knowledge or to make her in his likeness. But the reality is, she was already like God. She just had to go back to the source. And so I want to challenge, if any of you are asking, did God really say that he has a plan for my life? Does he have good intentions for me? Remember Eve, who gave up everything to buy what she already had. And so... Whatever questions, 
temptations you are asking, go back to the word to answer it. Because knowledge is everything when it comes to the word of God and faith. If you're visiting us today, my challenge is study the Bible with the person who brought you out. The world can't give you the answers your heart longs for, but the Bible can. And for disciples, have a memory scripture every week based on whatever truth you may be struggling to accept. And so I love you so much, sisters, and to God be all the glory. Well, good evening, ladies. My name is Imani Funden, and I get the honor to be able to preach to you all tonight. Um, I'm really excited. I'm grateful that Jenna was able to talk about goodness and that Laura was able to talk about knowledge. And to add to that, I'm going to be talking about self-control. And uh, if you guys can, please turn with me to Luke chapter 9. And just to give you a little backstory about uh, this passage, um, we actually usually read this in the discipleship study. And it's actually interesting because at the time, Jesus was actually speaking to a group of uh, a group of people who wanted to be able to follow him. You know, they wanted to be able to actually be super, super close to him as he was able to preach God's word. And the title of my short charge is The Freedom of Self-Denial. In Luke chapter 9, it says, verse 23, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Wow. And I really appreciate this scripture because as we read it, it's interesting how Jesus wants us to be able to deny ourselves and carry our cross in order to be able to follow him. It's not just say, right? But we have to actually put into action. And I love this because Something I think about when it comes to denying ourselves, it can be something as simple as whenever you have to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning and your alarm clock goes off and you want to so badly snooze it, but instead you deny yourself and you wake up. You wake up to have a great quiet time. You wake up to actually be able to pour yourself out. Another way is usually when you want to be able to get that fast food and you know your budget is not really budgeting, <laughs> but instead, right, you want to deny yourself, and you want to be able to meal prep. <laughs> when I was actually looking at the definition of self-control, another word for it is actually self-discipline. And the definition for that is the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses, the ability to pursue what one thinks is right despite temptations to abandon it. And it's actually interesting because... I was looking and I was thinking about what are two ways that we usually tend to lack um, self-denial or self-control. And one of the two ways that I saw it was, one, whenever we have a break, right? I know a lot of college students are on spring break and even winter break and stuff when it comes. But then also the second one is usually whenever we go through trials. You know, whenever something is like a lot of pressure, we can tend to want to not actually deny ourselves. And honestly, ladies, if I'm being honest, I can relate to this. Um, I think that last month, uh, one of my closest friends and one of our closest friends actually decided to walk away from God. And they decided that they didn't want to seek, they didn't want to deny themselves anymore. They didn't want to have that self-control just like Jesus calls us to in the scripture. Um, and honestly, I think that when it happened, um, I, I felt very angry. You know, I felt very angry because I was like, man, like, like, why didn't you, why, why, why didn't you say anything? You know, why didn't you call for help? But also I felt angry at myself because I felt like, man, Imani, why didn't you see the signs? You know, did you see that they were actually screaming for help? And when I started to pray about it more and I started to think about it more, I actually realized that, like, what I actually felt was deep sadness and abandonment. You know, this was somebody who I came from Dallas with to L.A., and God was doing great miracles and great things. And I felt like I was developing a close friendship. I felt like this, this person was somebody that I was super close to and I could look up to. And I felt like I was losing a best friend. And honestly, it was a big shift. And I think that for me to get open, I had temptations about uh, just thoughts of numbing out 
to masturbation and actually having thoughts of uh should I even should I even feel sad should I even feel like I don't have to I don't have to feel sad anymore should I quickly get over this and I was just wrestling with this and honestly I'm very grateful for the women in my life like Kiara and Regine and Melita and just different people where I was able to go to God in prayer and I was able to wrestle with what I was feeling you know, that I was able to take it to God. And ultimately, I was able to learn how to have self-control and to deny myself over what I was feeling. And I really love the scripture that Jenna shared in Second Peter 1, 5 to 7. And I love the last point that it says, unto mutual affection, love. Because with Jesus, Jesus, he wanted everything but to not have to die. He wanted to be able to live. He wanted to not have to die on the cross. But instead, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed to God with his close friends, and he was able to get surrendered and have that self-control through God. He was able to surrender. And I really appreciate that because that shows us the greatest love of all, the greatest action, which was that Jesus died on the cross for us so that the way we can have salvation. And I have a challenge for you ladies. And I wanted to ask you guys, what are areas of your life that you feel like you're lacking self-control? Write them down and uh, uh, talk to the person who brought you out or even your spiritual mentor to see what are ways that you can be able to have great accountability to be able to learn how to wrestle with God in prayer, but also how to actually fight for that self-control. Ladies, in closing, I truly believe, right, that if we wrestle with God in prayer through the knowledge of the scriptures, just like Laura talked about, we can actually be able to have the freedom of self-denial. And to God be all the glory. Oh. Are we having a good night tonight, ladies? <laughs> well, thank you to all the speakers um, that already preached. Thanks, Imani, for preaching about self-control. And if you're going to have self-control, you got to add to that perseverance. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. The title of my short charge is Get Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. So turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 3 to 5. And for sake of time, I'll start reading it. So it says, not only so... But we glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And so here, the scripture calls us to glory whenever we suffer. And I don't know about you, but whenever I'm in hardships, I don't really feel like jumping up and down and being happy about it. In my nature, I can get very discouraged and wonder, like, why is this happening to me? But the Bible tells us that the reason why we can glory in our sufferings is because it produces character and hope. And that word persevere in the Greek is hypomani, hypomani, which means cheerful or hopeful endurance and patience. And this isn't a patience that can just sit there and wait till the storm passes. It's long suffering. And let's be honest, there are so many other things we'd rather run to than suffer. Maybe it's sleep, comfort food, impurity. And honestly, when I think about my life, all I desired to do was do things the easy way. School was never terribly difficult for me growing up, so honestly, when I got to UCLA, it was a really big slap in the face. Um, I didn't have any teachers to hold my hand or friends to keep me accountable. I was just left with myself and my character, and I realized that I had none. And so when challenges came my way, I sinned out for comfort. I numbed the pain with alcohol and parties, even with men, I wanted the guy who could buy me things so I could be a trophy wife and not work. That was me. Um, and I would have traded that for actual love. I very quickly saw that the result of that was more loneliness and brokenness and emptiness that I had ever felt before in my life. 
And so I decided to study the Bible. But because I was in so much pain prior to that, I thought that the Christian life would be all sunshines and rainbows. And honestly, the way that I would describe this last year is not that way. <laughs> it's, it's been long suffering. I remember at the beginning of the school year, I was only responsible for myself. But as the quarter went on, I started mentoring women, I got into cops, I started leading Bible studies like the kingdom, and honestly, I was so overwhelmed to have to balance ministry and school and work, and I was just crying out to God. I wanted my gym time, I wanted mornings to myself, I wanted evenings to myself, I just wanted to be comfortable, but God kept calling me to push. But now... I disciple three amazing women. Shout out to Zephyra, Sudave, and Kelly, who's here in the crowd. Um, and glory be to God, because our Bible talk has been able to save so many more amazing women. My grades that quarter were actually better than they were my first comfortable years of, at UCLA. Um, my relationships with my family has grown so much. But had I decided to not persevere, Maybe the women that I mentor now wouldn't be here. Maybe I would have been stuck in my life of sin again. Had I decided to not persevere, I would have died spiritually. See, perseverance is not an option. It's a necessity because your comfort zone will kill you. <laughs> Satan tries to chase us with comfortability, and you think that's what you're looking for, but it's not. The challenges in our lives are not meant to hurt us. They're actually meant to help us. But if we choose to throw in the towel when things get tough, we will not build character, we will not get hope, and we will not see the finishing product that God is trying to show us. So my question for you sisters is where are you avoiding suffering? Maybe it's sharing your faith. Whether you're married, single, or a student, this one's for you. I challenge you to share, with, share your faith with three people every day. And maybe that seems like easy peasy, but what about the days where you're coming home tired after church and all you want to do is take a nap? Or when you're coming home from work and you just want to chill out and watch a movie? Get those three women. Share with those three women in line at Starbucks. Do it when it hurts. If you're a student, maybe you struggle with showing up to class or doing your assignments. This upcoming quarter or semester, don't miss a single class or assignment. The Bible calls us to be excellent in everything, ladies. <laughs> and if you're currently studying the Bible, maybe it's gotten challenging. Keep going and get open with the person you're studying with. Choose your walk with God over your comfortability. What, whatever area this is for you, challenge yourself and be consistent. The goal is long-suffering. As you take on these challenges, ladies, hold on to the end result that God promises. The Bible says that hope will never put us to shame. It will never disappoint. So let's be women who choose to get comfortable being uncomfortable. To God be all the glory. Wow. That was awesome. These have all been so good. So Erica preached on perseverance, and I got the honor to be preaching to you all tonight about godliness, how we add on to our godliness. So the title of my lesson today is called Sprung On to Godliness. And please, if you will, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 16. And as we're turning there, a little bit of context about what's happening in this chapter is Paul's explaining how leaders live godly lives, how they are above reproach, and how they are instructed to do proper worship. And then he goes on to explain why. And I can read verse 15, and it says, If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of the foundation of truth. Beyond all question, all question, the mystery from which godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed in on the world, was taken up into glory. And I love this passage of scripture. First, it explains our importance to God's church. We are not door hinges. We are not floorboards, but we are pillars, ladies. We are pillars and foundations of the truth. 
And then he goes on to say that godliness is actually sprung from this great mystery. And the great thing about godliness is it's translated into the Greek called ubisia, which basically means a godly heart response or someone's inner response to the things of God, which shows itself in great piety or reverence. So godliness is actually a response to our knowledge of the true God. And the more we truly more know God, the more it causes us to revere and respect him in our lives. And I can think of an example. I had an amazing history professor when I was in seventh grade, and I absolutely adored this class. I never talked. I was there on time. I loved listening to him, and he always lifted me up for all of my essays and my things that I did in the classroom, and I had a lot of respect and reverence for him because I loved him so much. I loved learning, and I didn't want to break the rules. And lately, I found myself, ladies, not in that position with God. I've, I've kind of contorted my view of God in a little way because I think that sometimes, like, he's mad at me. And then I want to avoid sharing my faith or I want to avoid getting open because I think that he's mad at me and I'm just going to feel worse. And it's just this weird contorted version in my sin because I'm not reminding myself of who God truly is, how much he truly loves me, how he views me. And so it really left me in a place where I was feeling bitter and angry at my leaders, um, not wanting to accept correction, and thinking that I wasn't doing a good job, thinking that God was saying he was disappointed in me, when that is so far from the true. The Bible here says that godliness and this reverence of our lives comes from when we truly, truly understand that he loves us and that he is amazing and that he rose from the dead. And so the way to live that Proverbs 31 type of lifestyle, ladies, is to really remind yourself how God sees you, who he really is. And so I want to challenge you all today. Um, this is a practical that always softens my heart towards God. Um, I always look up whenever I'm feeling sad or discouraged. I'm like, how does God see me? And I go and look at scriptures, and an example is for 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I am a new creation. I am born again. I am, I am not my old self. I am completely new. And Matthew 5, 15, I am the light of the world. Calcadon's the light of the world. Kiana's the light of the world. Shara's the light of the world. We are lights of the world, ladies. And in Romans 8, 38, we are deeply loved beyond measure. Nothing from anything in this whole world can separate us from the love of God. And so really taking on these challenges and reminding myself by putting sticky notes on my mirror, ladies, or a sticky note in your car door, and really holding on to God's word and reminding yourself who we're serving. He's not ashamed. He's not guilty. He's not, he's not embarrassed by us, but he truly, truly loves us. So ladies, let's respond to this awesome, amazing God with reverence and show ourselves to be godly in our lives because of who he is. And to God be all the glory. Good evening, ladies. My name is Lizzie Garcia. I am so grateful to get to preach tonight. And thank you so much, Aubrey, for preaching on godliness. So to add on to godliness, we're going to be talking about mutual affection. And so the title of my lesson is Fight to Forgive. So the word mutual affection, it can be defined as sympathy towards one another or harmony between people sympathy towards one another, or harmony between people. And what's interesting is that if you read our theme scripture in the Passion Translation, you'll see that the word mutual affection is actually replaced for the word mercy. And so if you think about it, it does make sense because in order for us to show mutual affection towards one another, we have to show mercy towards each other. And so while I was reading about mercy and mutual affection, a scripture came to mind. So please, ladies, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 22. Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22. For the sake of time, I'll go ahead and read. It reads, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. 
In this scripture, Jesus calls Peter to forgive not once, not twice, but 77 times. So this tells us that we're going to have to practice forgiveness over and over and over again. And in this example, Jesus is not just talking about forgiving anyone, but he's talking about forgiving your brothers and sisters in God's kingdom. And you see, sisters, it's difficult to have mutual affection towards a sister when there's no forgiveness or no harmony between you and that sister. And if I can be open, sisters, I've noticed that for myself, uh, forgiveness isn't always o- or unforgiveness isn't always obvious or outward. Sometimes what unforgiveness can look like is struggling to give my whole heart to a sister, to show them affection, or even just feeling weird around a sister sometimes. I'm sure some of us can relate. And so one of the practicals that I was given when it comes to forgiveness is to reflect and write down a list of disciples who I haven't forgiven or don't feel mutual affection towards. And I remember a few months ago when I was writing down this list, I was like, ooh, this list is a little bit longer than I expected. Um, but when I thought about situations that inspired those, th- those that are, were on the list, uh, different feelings were coming up, like feelings of abandonment, feelings of hurt. And to be honest, I started to feel embarrassed of just how much time had passed since those situations happened. And I never did or said anything to resolve that conflict. And so instead of taking ownership for not resolving the conflict sooner, instead I allowed myself to grow feelings of bitterness or even assumption over these sisters. And so not getting open meant hardening my heart in an attempt to practice self-preservation. But what really was exposed was my lack of care for these relationships. And so I was challenged to call and to talk to every single sister on this list and to take accountability for my sin in these situations. And so by being open and having these conversations, they actually went a lot better than I expected. Uh, It really helped deepen our relationships and it helped my heart completely soften, ladies. And so my challenge for you tonight, ladies, is the same challenge that was given to me. So first, pray, reflect, and write down a list of all those that you feel unforgiveness towards. And so this unforgiveness, again, can look like unresolved conflict between you and a sister, holding your heart back from a sister, or even feeling hurt towards someone or something that they did. Get advice and have these conversations with those on your list, and if you're not able to talk to them, write a forgiveness letter to them. And first, pray for your heart and be ready to hear whatever it is that their response is. And ultimately, make a decision to forgive no matter how the conversation goes. So ladies, by fighting to forgive, we'll be able to have sincere mutual affection in God's kingdom. Hello. Well, good evening, ladies. Can we just give it up for all the amazing short charges? And Lizzie just preached on mutual affection, and I have the honor of preaching the last one in the list, love. And so let's turn to 1 John 4. (laughs) And here, the love that is used is referred to agape love. And so agape love is actually the highest form of love out of the four forms that are used in the Bible. And agape love specifically is a self-sacrificial, unconditional kind of love. And let's pick it up in verse 19. In 1 John 4, verse 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. And that's the title of my short charge today, He First Loved Us. And so to grow in our love for God, we need to really grow in our understanding of how much God actually loves us. And so I have a fun little illustration um, for all the science girlies out there. I want you to think about amoebas. So for those who don't know, amoebas are small organisms, um, and they reproduce asexually through binary fission. But when you think about when an amoeba reproduces, it doesn't have much love for the child it just produces, right? They just coexist. But then when we go up a level of complexity, let's look at birds, right? When mama birds build their little nests for their babies and feed them worms, there's a good amount of love there, amen? And then once we go up another level, we can look at something like elephants. So elephants are known to actually care so much for their young that when their calf dies, 
they actually get suicidal and they actually stop eating. And once we think about humans, yet another level of complexity, we would die for our children, right, mothers out there? We would totally die for our children. And we see a trend here that as we grow in complexity, our expression and our capability for love actually increases as well. But how much more complex is God, the creator of all things, the creator of all things that exist, of the universe? God is the ultimate expression of love. And to be honest, my love for God is nowhere near this. You know, in my selfishness, I think my love can sometimes depend on so many things. It can be very dependent on my situation, on whether or not I have a job, on whether or not, you know, my day is going great, on whether or not I woke up with energy. Even the smallest things are able to shake my love for God. Yet what's super awesome is that God's love is dependent on nothing. God's love is flawless and God's love is perfect. And understanding that God is perfect love, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 13 in a slightly different way. And this is something that Jenna actually shared with us. And in verse 4, if we understand that God is perfect love, we can read it as, God is patient, God is kind. God does not envy, God does not boast, God is not proud. God does not dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no records of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. And so I have a challenge for you all today to better understand God's love, to read through each of these aspects of love as described in 1 Corinthians 13 and find the one that you are lacking in the most. Find the one in which you can work on the most and study out how God exemplifies that feature and go after imitating that. We love because God first loved us. He still loves us and he will always love us. I love you all and to God be all the glory. Thank you.